Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review. As you well know, along with the able assistance of our Vice Chair, Senator Nielsen, and many others on our committee, uh, we completed our conference committee work on Thursday night. As such, the budget bill in chief has been accessible to the public since Saturday, and with full respect to our 72-hour accessibility to the public, we'll be able to take up the bill on our deadline of Wednesday, June 15th. Additionally, of course, we will have trailer bills. Those are the bills that spell out all the implementing language for all the appropriations that are to be found in the budget bill itself. There are seven on our agenda today that we will be taking a vote on. Then there are another two due to some technical problems with them had to be pulled back from the desk and resubmitted. Uh, because they have not been sitting as long as the other seven, we'll hear them today, but we won't take the vote today. Then we'll be coming back on Wednesday to full budget committee for an additional four, maybe five new trailer bills, which we will hear and vote on, plus the two that we're hearing today, but not voting on. So that will be our budget committee work on Wednesday. And then on the floor Wednesday, I'll be presenting the budget bill itself. And as many of these, minus the two, trailer bills uh, that we can get through on Wednesday, the balance of which, along with the four or five new trailer bills, which we'll hear here in committee on Wednesday, we will take up and take action on the floor on Thursday. Mr. Chairman, that'll include the energy bill too, right? <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Yes. So uh, with all of that said, let's call the roll, please. Leno? Here. Nielsen? Here. Allen? Here. Anderson? Here. Bell? Block? Here. Glazer? Here. Hancock? Here. Mitchell? Monning? Here. Morlock? Wynn? Pan, Here. Pavley, Roth, Here. Stone, Wolk. Thank you, colleagues. We do have our quorum. So we welcome Ms. Costa back to our committee. And we will begin with AB 1599, which is the Budget Act of 2015. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Amy Costa with the Department of Finance. Uh, many of the bills before the committee today have been publicly available on the, Department of Web, uh, the department's website since January. Additionally, many of the bills before you have been heard either in subcommittees or conference committees, so I'll just be highlighting some of the key provisions of each of the bills before you this afternoon, but happy to answer any questions as always. As the chair noted, AB 1599 is the supplemental appropriation bill for the current year. It provides an augmentation of $50.1 million general fund and $40.3 million unallocated special funds to address a few unanticipated costs in the current year. $40.1 million general fund is to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation for various unanticipated costs, including increased janitorial services at the California Health Care Facility, increased pharmaceutical costs, and population-related health care costs. The second item is $7,580 general fund to reimburse Mariposa County related to a homicide trial. The third item is 40.3 uh, million unallocated special funds to the Department of Healthcare Services for the increased long-term care fee revenue expenditures. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Any questions from the committee? Do we have any public comment? So this again just adjusts the current year budget, recognizing unintended expenditures that we now face. Take a motion from Senator Wolk, and we'll call the roll. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Allen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? Aye. Wynn? Aye. Pan? Aye. Pavley? Roth? Aye. Stone? Aye. Wolk? All right, measure passes 15 to zero.
Our next item is AB 1600, which is our education trailer bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. AB 1600 is the education trailer bill. It makes statutory changes related to child care, preschool, and the K-14 education system. Again, I'll highlight just a couple of the, the higher level items in this particular trailer bill. This bill uh, provides $2.9 billion Proposition 98 general fund uh, for the transition to the local control funding formula in the 2016-17 fiscal year. It provides $1.1 billion one time uh, and another $141 million reappropriated Proposition 98 general fund savings for local discretionary needs and priorities as well as to pay down the state's outstanding K-14 mandate liability. This bill also provides $200 million one time uh, Proposition 98 general fund to establish the college readiness block grant. Um, additionally, this bill provides increased reimbursement rates for child care providers uh, as well as identifies the intent of the legislature to make future increases to provider reimbursement rates to the extent funding is available. Lastly, the bill also provides $20 million one-time Proposition 98 general fund to create the Charter School Startup Grant Program to allocate funding to support startup costs for new charter schools. Those are some of the highlights. Obviously, the bill does many more things, and we're here to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. We had some earnest conversations with you and the administration with regard to how we're going to ensure we have sufficient number of credentialed teachers in our school system given all the challenges facing them and the system, cost of housing in so many parts of the state that aren't sustainable with teacher salaries, uh, drop off in those who are entering into the credentialed system, the high cost of the education. And we had a slightly different approach from the governor. Could you just walk us through some of the teacher-related packages. I think, uh, has to, for example, the $20 million in one time for the Classified Employee Teacher Credentialing Program, the $10 million to the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and then also establishing the California Center for Teaching Careers. Absolutely. We did propose a number of items uh, related to increasing the pipeline for teacher preparation. And as part of the final uh, conference compromise, we do have a number of items both that the administration put forward as well as the legislature. As you noted, there is $20 million provided one time within Prop 98 for five years to establish the uh, California Classified School Employees Credentialing Program and to provide grants to the K-12 school districts to support recruitment of non-certified uh, school employees to participate in teacher credentialing programs. There's also $10 million, um, and this was part of our proposal, uh, in non-Prop 98 general fund uh, for the Integrated Teacher Preparation Grant Program, and this would provide competitive grants both to public and private universities to offer an integrated teacher credentialing program within four years. So you'd be able to get your bachelor's degree as well as a credential within the four-year time period. Um, we also, the bill also provides $5 million one-time Proposition 98 uh, for a multi-year competitive grant to establish an operation the California Center on Teaching Careers, and that's really um, a, a website and social media to help recruit individuals into the teaching profession and to let them um, understand the different uh, teaching job opportunities that are available. Do we have an actual identified number as to how many teachers we're going to need in the years to come? And to what degree this package will get us there and what else we may need to be doing in the future? There you go. Uh, Thomas Todd, Finance. I don't have any numbers that I can share with you today uh, in terms of what we think this particular package of investments will yield. Uh, those are conversations uh, that we will continue to have both with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing as well as the Department of Ed. Um, it would be purely speculative for me to throw out any kind of figures right now about what this will actually do in terms of how many folks we might bring on as a result of these investments. The other question that you posed, uh, you know, in terms of uh, shortages, uh, we've seen different numbers, and so I don't, I don't want to quote any specific figure right now. Um, we could, we could certainly try to get some more information and provide that to you and your staff and any other interested member. Uh, but at this point, I don't think we have anything solid that we could probably share. 
Ms. Costa? Uh, yes, I would note there are perennial areas of teacher shortage in the state, which includes special education, mathematics, and science, and so we definitely think that these uh, programmatic augmentations will help in those areas. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's that much more severe in the Bay Area due to our high cost of housing, but that's a factor across the entire state with some variances. So I don't know if I'm imagining that the problem's greater than it is, but I think that if we can, and I think we have agreed, given that we're investing some significant amounts of money for this purpose, that to be effective, aside from just making an investment, that we need to know, one, a little more clearly what the problem is. So if you could do some number crunching, scrubbing, and get back to us as what we think the need will be in the next couple of years, or at least in the budget year, that this investment is for what it might even be for five years, if that's doable. And then I think it would be helpful for us to get a clearer idea of how far this particular investment, combination of investments, will get us toward that goal. Because otherwise, I think we're going to be operating somewhat in the dark. And th this is, goes without saying, such a crucial, it is, it's our investment our educational system is its teachers. So somehow or other, I think we've got to get some greater clarity uh, on the fact of the problem, the details of the problem, and to what degree this investment will get us there so that we can then start looking ahead to figure out what more we need to do because this just can't remain unattended. Yeah, I, I assure you that we ourselves, the administration, uh, want a better sense for what this investment will actually yield. Absolutely. Okay, so if you could share that with us when you have that determination. And then going back to early care and education, I've had some conversations with some of my colleagues that the reimbursement schedules are so complex the way they are and they're about to get even more complex and there's going to be some responsibility on the providers themselves as to which way they turn for their reimbursement. Number one, do we think this is something that most people can digest? I'm having trouble enough myself. Uh, uh, there will be an exam later, everybody, so pay attention. And how are we, uh, is there any belief or suggestion that there should be some assistance to the providers to help them maneuver their way through all of this, uh, which I, could likely fall to the counties, but how are we going to either work with the counties, incentivize the counties to to better translate what we're doing here? I would note it is complex. We've had many conversations both in conference committee as well as in the subcommittees about the complexity of the rate structure for child care in the state. And um, I, our belief is that these increased rates will help address the new minimum wage that we've adopted here in the state. And I'll defer to my colleague Erica on the technical assistance that might be forthcoming. Erica Lee with the Department of Finance. Um, the administration is very interested in um, having conversations about simplifying the rate structure. And I think we've, we've um, begun down that path during this budget year, budget cycle. So we look forward to continue having those conversations with stakeholders to um, essentially reform the rate structure system, but also to work with stakeholders to make sure that it, it makes sense. So th that's the latter is more to my point, which is yes, we're, we need to figure out some better system. But in the meantime, is is there any plan to be of assistance to those who are doing the work, but may not have the opportunity to grasp all that we're doing here. Yes, and I would just add that we are working with um, the Department of Education and, and attempting to, um, again, move forward with the simplification of that and to um, get information out to the county offices of education and others to assist with that. Okay, and yes, it should not go, as Ms. Costa has already made reference to the fact that we're making a significant investment in the rates that we will be affording those who are doing the good work of working with our youngest and over the next few years will grow to a significant amount of money, which uh, I think from our perspective will sustain the local infrastructure so that in years ahead we can build off of that to increase the slots because we do recognize we have over a couple hundred thousand eligible children waiting 
for a, a slot themselves. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify, after our briefing, I got clarification from staff, and it really will be the responsibility of the Department of Education okay. and their communication to providers and to um, AP agencies. And so it, it's our hope that that communication is as clear and, and succinct as can be, because sometimes it is not. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate hearing from the administration that they'll be working with the advocate community to really try to make sure that we are very clear in terms of what the options are. And so it's not the county, sir, it's the Department of Education who um, has responsibility to write those, um, not all county letters, but whatever the equi equivalent is, They're the memos. Um, um, outlining the change in policy. And so making sure that those are clear as possible will be very helpful in what will undoubtedly be good news yet confusing. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Wynn, and then I want to okay, Senator Wynn, followed by Senator Nielsen. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a comment and I also have a question. Um, I'm very happy to see that the budget included um, funding for the college readiness block grant. Uh, I, but my, so I just have one question, um, just more of just to make sure that I understood it correctly. So in the original proposal, SB 1050 has the, has this aid was only available to schools with 75% of students that are qualified for free and reduced lunch. English learners and foster care. Um, I support SB 1050 uh, because I believe that we need to help these students, but I also recognize that it is important to help any student in this category, regardless of the school they attend. So is the budget trailer limited to those high concentrated schools or are we providing assistance to all schools that serve these children or students? To answer the question, it's all students. So all unduplicated students uh, in all of those schools uh, in grades nine to 12, that's what we're targeting with this money. Great, perfect, thank you. And then just a comment, Mr. Chairman, um, as part of the Women's Caucus, I'm um, very, proud and happy that we were able to help secure more than 500 million multi-year investment for childcare and preschool. As a mother myself with two preschool children, um, I know all too well how expensive putting your child through daycare today. If you live in an urban area like me in Orange County, that cost becomes so burdensome that some families cannot afford to own a home due to how much childcare will cost them. So both of these issues have been very important to me and my community, and so I'm very glad that the legislature is finally addressing the growing gaps between income, living costs, and, and allowing individuals and younger families like myself be able to start a family and also be able to have children and be able to live in where they want to in the state of California. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Wynn. Senator Nielsen. I, I noticed that the um, third year in a row now that we're not going to be doing any testing in our K-12. Do we have any plans, the administration going ahead to resume some testing so our parents can quantify the success of public education? Um, Senator Nielsen, we're still in, uh, in a bit of a transition phase, so you're right. Uh, we have transitioned to Common Core aligned tests in both English language arts and mathematics. We are also on the cusp of, uh, of adopting um, an evaluation rubric, which will allow schools to assess where they are uh, in meeting benchmarks uh, in those areas, plus other areas. And as part of that, what the state board is doing is they're going to they're going to be aligning essentially our accountability system with the new federal accountability system, so that moving forward, we have a more transparent system that is integrated. Uh, in other words, under the previous structure, we had a separate federal accountability system and a state accountability system. Moving forward, those two systems will be married. And so in 1718, the evaluation rubrics uh, will be adopted, uh, will be in use. Uh, and you know, as part of that, as moving into that next year, uh, we will be uh, actually, districts will actually be using uh, that evaluation rubric uh, to assess uh, where students are and they will actually start, we will actually start holding them accountable obviously uh, for where students are beginning in 1718 and moving forward. So we're very close to the point uh, where folks um, 
uh, were the assessments, student assessments, not just limited to test scores, obviously, because under the new federal law, it's a multifaceted system. We're not just going to look at a single test score, but we're gonna look at a variety of other different measures, suspension rates, dropout rates, things like that. Uh, and so the board is in the process of developing uh, that, that entire accountability system right now. Uh, it's slated for final adoption at their September meeting, so we're getting very close. We're still in a bit of a, a, a transition phase though. Will a majority or any large portion be subjective rather than say quantitative or test based? Uh, we, within, the, within the broader LCAP uh, itself there are certainly uh, measures um, that are more qualitative in nature but uh, the, the five core measures that the board is working to develop right now that align themselves uh, with the new ESSA, the new federal accountability system, lend themselves to metrics and quantification. Understood. The uh, administration is now proposing to cut the CTE from 400 to 300. Is that based on some particular reason? Uh, ADA or whatever? No, so this, this actually goes back to last year's budget. So when we put together last year's budget, uh, the administration and the legislature came to an agreement on a $900 million investment over three years. And so the way it works is at the state level, that phases down. So it started last year at 400 million. This year, 1617, it'll be 300 million, and then it phases down to 200 million in 1718. Each year that the state's investment phases down, there is a matching requirement as part of this program, as you may know, and that requires an in incremental increase in the local share so that you're actually spending the same amount in any given year. But the whole idea on phasing down the state's investment is for locals to sustain these programs with LCFF moving forward. So that so the so the step down from four 400 to 300 was all planned. That was all agreed to last year as part of the as part of the any package. projection next year to go another step down then? It will go, it will go to $200 million right. next okay. year. Okay, but would that be then the floor, 200? No, that will be the final state level investment. And then the idea is that it is sustained permanently on an ongoing basis with LCFF resources at the local. And then will the incentive grants uh, to all uh, CTE be maintained beyond? I think that with the three-year program, is that going to be continued, or do you know yet? At this point, there are no plans to continue a state-level investment beyond three years. So in terms of uh, sort of long-term accountability, in terms of what people do with these programs, the, you know, the board is working on, well, first of all, within the LCAP itself right now, there are certainly requirements uh, for school districts to... Um, uh, to indicate what they're doing to meet the CTE needs of students. I mean, that's in an LCAP right now. The board, though, is also, as part of their work uh, in terms of what they're gonna develop and adopt at their September meeting, they are, um, they are still working to develop both college and career readiness measures. And so uh, our hope moving forward is between what's already required in the LCAP and between what the board is going to put in place in terms of a new accountability system, that districts have more than enough incentive to actually tell folks what they're doing uh, for students uh, with respect to their CTE needs moving forward. Well, it's very much appreciated the governor's commitment to those incentive grants, and we hope that the districts will find that of value. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nielsen. Senator Pavley. Since we're on education. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So um, I wanted to, um, I, I suppose, uh, ask a question. Um, part of the discussion that I've been following through the budget subcommittee process uh, for the last couple of years is in regards to reinstituting the Apple program, the loan forgiveness program. Um, we're experiencing about 75% less students going through the teacher credentialing programs, in, primarily in our CSUs. And frankly, part of the problem is uh, the student loan debt that many of these students are acquiring because as you know you're going to be a teacher it takes five years of college and you're coming out of college with perhaps twenty five thirty five thousand dollars of student loan so a very successful program that pre-existed prior to 2012 was a loan forgiveness program in exchange for teaching about four years in one of those um, uh, areas uh, difficult excuse me um, shortage areas like math and science or especially special education where over 50% of our special ed teachers are getting 
uh, they're teaching with waiver credentials, which means they haven't had uh, full complementary of courses, and it's very difficult to succeed. Just by background, I taught middle school for 29 years, so. But at a time when you went through college and you didn't have any student loan debt, so one of the bigger obstacles for attracting people to go into the teaching profession um, is finding a way to sort of marry both needs of attracting teachers into the profession, but also filling those most difficult slots. And it also looked at um, disadvantaged communities and attracting teachers down there. I know uh, personally that uh, if you survive three or four years of teaching and you're in the same school, you're probably in it for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You make career changes mm -hmm. if you're not, and you'll probably stay at that school as you make relationships with parents and other teachers. So the problem's been the last three years, a uh, lack of funding during the recession, general fund. Uh, my understanding is through um, Senator Block's committee that money that is still in the Teacher uh, Credentialing Commission for the prior Apple program that was stopped, there's leftover monies there, is available to fund the program for 117 students to reimburse them their student loan costs or a portion of student loan costs for four years. It's there, ready to go. Um, and so to complement a center being started on how to attract new teachers, this would actually complement that, that goal with existing money. And so I'm very puzzled uh, why um, this continues to be an obstacle. Uh, with existing money in an existing account for that specific purpose. Uh, Senator Pavley, I was not actually aware uh, of the dollars uh, that were still left within the account. I'm certainly happy to take a look at that and get back to you. I'm not. So, uh, no, go ahead, sorry. No, I was looking at Senator Block because it came out through his subcommittee process and he's brought it up three or four times. Senator Block? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, in, in sub one, we did in fact approve this expenditure, which was. Um, as Senator Pavley says, to use funding that had already been allocated to the program but had not been expended yet. Um, and once it went from our committee with approval to conference committee, it disappeared. I'm not sure why. Someone from conference would have to tell us. So, Ms. Costa, you're certainly welcome to weigh in, but my memory of it is that through the negotiations with the administration, there was not an interest, and I'm not sure how the balance in the account plays into this determination, but that there were some concerns with the efficacy of the program, that it was it the best way to continue going, but I'll let the administration defend itself. Um, I would just note, and we're happy to look at the balance of the account going forward, I would note that this is a unique program in that you pay people in arrears. So it's actually after they've gone through, you are forgiving their loan after they've completed school. And I think from the administration's perspective, uh, and we have long talked about this really more in the higher ed realm, um, we're interested in lowering the overall cost of going to college. And so our proposal for the $10 million would consolidate the, the bachelor's with the teaching credential as something that we would like to pursue going forward. Um, we're happy to come back to the committee with more information on any remaining um, balances within that account. Thank you, Ms. Costa. So that was a bit of the nature of the debate. And I'm just reminded that whatever monies were left in the account, and if you could get us uh, that figure, that they have already been reverted back to the general fund. Yeah, most people will go into teaching if they knew that at some point in time their student loan debt would be dismissed. So I don't. I know it's not up front, but if you knew that if you did five years out there, your student loan debt would be cut in half, I think that's an incentive. That's the whole nature of the program, and I would agree with you that there is an incentive for the concept being a win-win. The debt gets taken care of, and we get a credentialed teacher in a school in need of one. Well, beginning teacher salary, as we know, are 40000 If you have 30000 in student loan, you're counseled to go not go into teaching. Yes. Senator Block. One reason the Apple program is particularly good 
is, is that a lot of students don't make a decision to go into teaching until they're well into um, their college experience. Um, they may be two or three years in taking courses in, say, the history department or in the English department, and then decide they would like to go and get the additional credential year and teach. At that point, they've already racked up debt. So you can't really cover that in advance. When they know, and I, I was a dean in a college of education, and when I would tell students, look, if you go into teaching, you know, you're, you're an A student in history, A student in English, if you go into teaching and you teach in an area of high need, geographic area of high need, or a discipline of high need, um, you can get much of the loans you've taken out um, forgiven. And, and that was a great way to get students already engaged um, in, in higher education, much of the way through their, through their degree process to turn to education as, as a career. And once they're there, and they had to complete five years to get the loans completely forgiven, um, many of them were committed and still are teaching to this day. And by the way, it's not in lieu of the, the program, the $10 million, I think, set aside for collapsing a program from five year to four year. I think that's a great idea. Uh, that and this together would certainly produce more teachers for us. Thank you, Senator Block. So again, greater clarification of the nature of the debate, uh, which has already been decided. So uh, thank you, Senator Pavley, for not only all that background information, but your commitment and determination to see some furtherance of, of, of Apple. Are there any other questions that we have? Yes, Senator Morlock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is probably budget dust, but I didn't get a satisfactory answer in uh, sub one, and it's uh, this uh, additional 3.5 million uh, funding to the uh, Exploratorium in San Francisco, which I have been to when my children were uh, of the right age, and we really enjoyed the facility. But uh, I'm I'm seeing from our briefing that it's it's to provide statewide professional development and resources for the implementation of the next generation science standards, and it seems to me uh, creating standards of this nature would maybe be one tenth of the cost, like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so I'm I'm a little confused as to what we're paying for and what we're getting. But I'm also a little confused that uh, we have so many other fine um, children's science museums up and down the state. San Diego, we have Balboa Park, Orange County Discovery, Los Angeles, we have Exposition Park. And so I'm just kind of wondering about the, the no better, no worse. So I, I never got a good answer uh, on this one. Um, so I'm just curious if someone could help me out. So we'll try it again. This was in the governor's budget mm -hmm. and it will provide grants throughout the state of California, including many of the institutions you've just mentioned, but I'm going to let finance give you greater detail here. Sure. So, um, Senator Morlock, I think we think that the $3.5 million investment uh, is a very reasonable investment at that level. Um, you know, the Exploratorium has a pretty long history uh, of engaging uh, in this kind of work, and they actually have a scale that would allow them to reach all up and down the state. And so I think given their track record um, with these programs uh, and given the scale and the relationships that they have with the number of county offices uh, up and down the state, we actually thought that they were perfectly suited to do this work. I think one of the issues that was raised in the subcommittee um, uh, to your other point is that there are certainly other people that are in a position to provide this. Uh, you know, there are science centers in different areas of the state that could certainly do this. And so it was, you know, without prejudice to any of the rest of them, uh, we just knew that this particular um, uh, establishment had a long history engaging in this work. Uh, they actually used to receive some funding in the annual budget bill uh, to do this work. Uh, and so we thought that they were just particularly well suited uh, to pick up and start again. And just Could you confirm the chairman's comment that grants go to other? What, so like, the, the 3.5 million will actually go to the Exploratorium. Uh, it will actually pay for uh, people to uh, come to the Exploratorium in some cases, uh, but it will actually provide money for them uh, through, um, you know, through uh, internet and other sources to reach out and provide uh, professional development remotely. So some of it in-house, some of it remotely. Uh, all money goes to the Exploratorium and they will pay for the costs and help defray the costs, essentially, for faculty from all around the state to uh, come to the Exploratorium to some extent, but also receive training and materials uh, remotely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope that 
slightly better answers your question. Good. All right. Thanks for letting me get into the minutia, Mr. Chair. That's what we're here for. That's what trailer bills are all about. Any other questions? And do we have any public comment? I have a motion by Senator Roth. So moved. This is our education trailer bill, AB 1600. We have a motion. Call the roll, please. The motion is due pass. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Allen? Anderson? Aye. Bell? Aye. Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? Aye. Wynn? Aye. Pan? Aye. Pavley? Roth? Aye. Stone? Aye. Wolk? Aye. 